in this video I'm going to show you how to make a watercolour chart so you can really get to know the colours in your paint box. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find everything watercolour as well as a little bit of mixed media and even some business and uh, social media for artists so please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon you will get notified each time I have a new video for you. Now if you saw my last video you will know that I have some new paints. I was lucky enough to be sent a whole new brand of paints so these are Jackman's watercolours and these are a brand new, brand new brand, brand new British brand and I luckily got sent some samples of them. Now this is not a sponsored video but I did not pay for these paints just to let you know. So I did a video all about the paint colours in depth. I'll put a link to that up above now so you can have a look at that one too if you want. But this video is all about how to make a colour chart from your paints and there are lots of different types of colour charts you can make and some of them are quite complex and they're all useful and I will go through lots more types of colour charts on this channel. But first of all, I just want to do a really basic video showing you how to make that basic first chart. It's not about mixing different colours together, it's about really understanding the colours that you have. Because when you look at a tube of paint like this, well it's a green, this one's kind of reddish, I can't see what colour this is. I don't know how transparent it is, I don't know how opaque it is. I don't know if it granulates, is it a very clear colour, is it a bright colour or a dull colour. Now all of these things will be answered when I make that basic colour chart. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to point the camera downwards. I'm going to give you some measurements for the uh, the way I make my colour charts. But bear in mind, if you're in America, you probably don't have the same standard size of, um, of paper and of folders as we have here, but it'll be quite easy for you to adjust. Now a colour chart is really, really important. And I'm going to point the camera down and show you how to do it right now. So here are my new paints and you can see that um, as I showed you in the last video I set them out onto my watercolour palette. Now it's really difficult when they're like this, when you've got a dark paint like this for instance to see exactly what colour it is. It probably looks quite different on the uh, on the label and um, you know different again in the pan and often when you've got a set of pan paints rather than tubes like this you might have several dark ones and you can't even remember what they are. Is that a dark grey or is it a green? So it's a really good idea to set them out on a chart. Now before you do that I want you to divide them into colour groups. So we're going to divide them into seven different groups and the first group is the primaries. So we've got three primaries. So what I want you to do um, is with all of your colours I want you to put them into groups. Either the tubes physically like this or if you're laying them out on the palette like I showed you last time. So what we're going to do first of all is we're going to find the primaries. So that's your blues put those together and that's your yellows, put those together, reds and pinks go together and then you've got um, earth colours, they sit together so earth colours, um, browns, blacks, greys, then you've got secondary colours that would be greens, oranges if you had some, I don't have them in this set they're not vital but if you have any oranges put those together and then violets and purples put those together. So that's your colour grouping and that's how I'm going to set these out. Now why do I want similar colours next to each other? It's because when I have my colour charts made it's going to be really useful. So let me show you, um, this is the folder that I keep my charts in. I'll go through sizes in a minute. I just want to show you an example of uh, some of my colour charts now. On the first page here I've got some yellows. Now imagine if I were painting some yellow flowers, some daffodils or some primroses. It's really easy for me, isn't it, just to look and see which yellow I need. Now that's hard to do if I've mixed the yellows up with all the other colours. So that's why you want similar colours together because it's really going to aid you when you're doing your painting. Now perhaps I have a, uh, a flower and it's not quite as light as that but it's not quite as orangey as this. It's somewhere between these two colours. What do I do? Well I'll mix them together and I'll get a colour in the middle. So that's a... Uh, a great way of using your paints and that's where we're going to put similar colours together. So if we go through here a bit further you can look, these are some older colour charts that I had. You'll notice that I've written the brands down and also the uh, the colour names. Now you may have got paints from all different sorts of brands in which case it's still worth doing this. You'll be amazed to learn that the colours with the same name like cobalt blue can vary between brands. 
you'll be even more amazed to learn that if you look on the uh, on the tubes and you find the pigment number you can get two colors with identical pigment numbers made from the exact same chemical pigment natural pigment and they will still vary between brands now why is that i don't 100 percent know but i have a pretty strong guess that it's to do with um, the pigment being bought from different sources different colors um, some earth pigments are literally dug up from the earth obviously these things come from different countries they might be prepared in different ways some of them are heated in different ways and some of them are mixed with different amounts of binder so just because you have two colors from different brands with exactly the same name even a single pigment color like a cobalt blue or ultramarine you will find variation between brands so that's why you want to put them next to each other so here's some blues these are some older color charts i had here's some secondary colors and i've got some earth colors going on down here more earth colors some pieces of paper that i cut ready i'll talk about sizes in a second these are the color charts i've been making most recently so a little bit smaller and again we've got the blues here and then I've been going into the um, the violets and the yellows what can happen is it can it can be quite tiring to make color charts and quite time consuming if you really can't face doing it then what you want to do is just draw the little squares and think to yourself right each time I start a new painting I'll just make a color chart of one color so just fill in one color each time you do a painting before you know it, you'll have done all of your colors this is a color chart a little bit different this one this is just some um, some random colors that I had extra to my main palette that I was trying out for somebody. So I just placed them on the paper. So just so I could initially see what they look like. So you'll notice the difference here. These, I have just got one swatch for each color. Whereas if we go up here, I have got, I'll move that across so you can see, I have got one color on each line. Now what happens is we put it on as dark as we can and we water it right the way down i'll show you how to do that in a second um, again i've got another color chart here these were some white knights watercolors i was sent by a manufacturer to try out and um, so again i wanted to know what they were like so i placed them on the paper there what have we got going on here here i've just got a little scribbled note of what sizes i'm drawing my new color charts to because i'm uh, rather obsessive about these things so I wanted to know what size the squares were and here again some older ones these are secondary color charts so here I'm mixing blues with yellows to get greens and I'll show you how to do the secondary charts in another video but what we're going to do now going back here is we're going to make this kind of color chart where you just take one single color and you take the paint across at this point let me apologize for the state of my nails some of you often mention that my nails look nice that's because um, I had cancer treatment up until recently and my nails were a bit rubbish so I thought I'd treat myself and have a nice lady down the road put these beautiful gel nails on but they last about three weeks and it's almost coming to three weeks and these are my Christmas nails and they're all falling off so let's talk briefly about sizes for color charts now you'll notice I've got these in plastic folders I sometimes teach day courses and uh, my students come along and they make all sorts of color charts and then maybe some of them come back to my regular classes and I look at those color charts you know a year down the road and they're all covered in paint splashes so although I'm not a huge fan of plastic these um, these folders are a pretty good idea this is not a special color chart folder this is um, if you're in the UK or in Europe this is a um, an A4 folder so this is just our standard letter stationery size and what I discovered, um, watercolour paper when you buy it in loose sheets comes in imperial sizes and it's a big sheet, I think it's something like 30 by 22 inches and then they cut it down so you can get half imperial, you can get quarter imperial. I've cut it in half again and this is eighth imperial and what I discovered is that if you cut your paper to one eighth imperial size it fits a dream inside an A4 punched pocket. Now if you're in America and you're thinking what on earth is she going on about? All you need to do is just find something similar. I don't know what letter size you have there. I'd be really interested to know that actually because it's a sort of geeky thing I like to know. So leave me a note in the comments. But um, you find your standard letter size and then just cut your watercolour paper a little bit smaller. Ideally, you're going to use the same paper that you use for painting your paintings. And that way you'll know that the colours are going to appear identical. So that's what you want to do there. Another option to this sort of big ring binder is this sort of folder. Um, this is an empty one but I sometimes use these as well and these are the ones that are slightly thinner if I show you the end they're slightly thinner 
and they come with these pockets, um, a certain amount of pockets already in and you can slot things in there. So if you want something to take along to a painting class, that's a good option too. Now, another thing that some people do if they have a pan a set of pan paints, you know, the blocks in a little, um, a little square box, what you can do is make a little color chart and then put your colors um, on a chart that's exactly the same size and in the same position as the colors and then you can put that in the lid. Again, they tend to get mucky, so you want to put a bit of plastic over that. If you're um, being very environmentally friendly, you're completely against plastic, at least get yourself a bit of greaseproof paper and um, keep it in your box between the colour chart and the top of the paint so that the paints don't transfer across. So that's how you're going to do it. And then you're going to um, get your piece of paper. You can just paint your paints on. I'm going to draw some lines like this because um, that's the sort of uh, boring person I am. So I'm going to get on now and get this piece of paper prepared and then I'll show you how to paint the swatches. So here I've got my lines drawn on the paper and um, have I messed up the mathematical measurements? Absolutely, yes, I have. But um, if you find the person in your life who's absolutely the worst at maths, I am worse than them. So that's why I'm an artist. OK, I'm going to show you again this one I did earlier. So you'll notice here that I put the brands of the paints underneath. And that's because this is a chart of all of the blues that I own. Um, regardless of manufacturer so it's important if I want to buy one of these colors again or if I need to look carefully at these colors it's important that I have the manufacturer there but this chart I'm making today is all going to be my Jackman's watercolors so what I've done is just written Jackman's art materials at the top and I'm going to put the uh, the paint um, colors underneath I've also putting a few of you were asking last time which just proves how geeky you are a few of you were asking for the pigment reference numbers so I'm going to put those on this chart as well. I'll talk more about those later. If you're a beginner, you absolutely do not need to know what the chemical composition of your paints are, but you do need to know what they look like. So I'm starting here with the yellows and I normally go um, cool to warm. So I'm going to start there. But if you don't understand warm and cool colours, then just group your colours, as I said at the beginning. So group all of your yellows together. Now I've got them here. I've got some water and um, I've got a piece of tissue paper because I don't want puddles in these. I want these little squares to dry evenly. So what I'm going to do is if I get any excess paint on my brush, I'll be able to just drop it off, drop it off onto, the, uh, onto the paper there. So I'm going to get some of the yellow paint. Now the idea with this is to start with the colour as strong as possible and then go down to as light as possible. This can actually take a little bit of practice, surprisingly. The first colour charts I did really were not very good. I didn't water the paint down enough. You sometimes find that having dipped into your paint once, you absolutely don't need to go back in again and may need to just take a lot of the paint off of your brush. So I'm going to start here with my um, cadmium lemon. So this is Jackman's Art Cadmium Lemon. It'll be really interesting later on to compare it when it's dried to my uh, my Talons Rembrandt. I did some, uh, some colour um, comparisons in the last video, but it'd be interesting to put dry squares right next to each other as well. So there's my paint at full strength. Now, yellow doesn't go particularly strong, so that's as strong as yellow will go. And then I'm going to start watering down. So I'm just going to rinse a little bit, pick up a little bit more water on my brush and start painting there. If you find that you've got too much, um, you've got rid of too much pigment, you've got too much water, just dip back in a little bit into your, uh, your paint box or your tube paint that you've squeezed out. Just pick up a little more. So I will show you in a minute as well with some of the uh, some of the darker colours, but we're going to start taking this paint down. I can't give you exact amounts of water you put in because it really depends on the colour and some colours like staining colours, you're going to need very little paint indeed. The idea is that by the time you get down to the, uh, the last square, you've got as little um, paint and as much water as possible so you can just about see it. And what that does is it shows you how the colour looks when it's fully watered down and it also will show you how transparent it is. Why is this last square smaller than all the others? It's because I can't do maths. One thing you will notice I did get right about the measurements though is I've left a gap between each square. Not only um, lengthways but also between each square and the next colour. 
it's really important when you're painting these that they don't run into each other as i said you don't need to be all geeky like me and draw squares you can just do it by eye but make sure that the um, colors don't touch each other because they will run from one to another now that last square is just looking a bit too similar to the one before it's going to put a bit more water in there Let's take a bit of pigment out see if we can get that nice and light so i'm fairly happy with that i'll do the yellow ochre next and then i'll go on and show you how to do one or two darker colors now when you're making color charts like this there are decisions to be made and the two main ones i can think of are yellow ochre because technically it's an earth color you could put it in with your earth colors I like it with my yellows because it's so yellow. The other color you might have trouble with is something like Payne's Gray, which is a really blue gray. Do you put it with your earth colors, your neutrals, or do, do you put it with the blues? I put it with the blues. There are other colors you may also find on the cusp, for instance, some of the red oxides. Are they a red? Are they a brown? There's no right or wrong answer when it comes to color charts. Put them where you think they will be most useful for you. So there's my yellow ochre down. Now, one thing you're going to find is that some colours look very different from the dark to the light. So your yellows kind of, well, they look dark yellow, now they look light yellow. There's not a lot of difference. But things like the reds, what you can find is that a colour that looks like a deep, dark red can actually be a vibrant, bright pink by the time it comes down to the last square. So this is why this is so important. Um, one thing I must tell you as well is you really, really need to change your water in between every single colour. That might seem, seem obsessive and it doesn't matter when you're generally painting quite as much as that. But when you're making colour charts, you need to make absolutely certain that the colour you're looking at is completely pure. You do not want to be painting um, the pink as I'm going to do next with yellow water. So I'm going to change my water. So I've got another jar here and I've got some completely clean water so I'll start the next one now I'm not going to uh, make you watch me paint all 11 of these colors but I will just show you how um, a dark color looks and we're going to start now with the quinacridone magenta so quinacridone is a word that uh, denotes that this is a synthetic pigment and we've got the uh, the pigment number here what I'll do is I'll show you this one and then I'll get on off of camera and um, paint all the rest and then I'll pop you back on at the end of the video to show you how they all look and what I've learned from putting my colours onto the colour chart. It will be merely a second away for people watching the video but for me it'll probably take about three quarters of an hour. So look at this lovely magenta and here I am just watering it down by picking up more water on my brush you'll notice I'm not leaving um, any puddles and I'm painting quite quickly I'm using a fairly large brush because if you use a tiny tiny brush you tend to get a lot of drying lines I have a whole video on um, different types of watercolor brush that you should avoid using and I'll put a link to that up above if you click any of those links you won't go off of this video it'll just line it up so that you can watch it later on if you want to or you can save them into your history on YouTube and have a whole load of videos backlog to watch like I do in the evenings when I'm cooking my dinner I tend to catch up on the people I follow on YouTube okay I just want to take a little bit more of the color out of there so that's really nice I've got my pink there as dark as it goes right down to as light as it goes so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to get on paint the rest of my color chart of the, my jackman's paints i'll show you at the end how they look and what i've learned from doing it so just before i show you those finished color charts i want to show you another way of doing the little color swatches if you haven't got the room to go across if you want a really really tiny color chart perhaps you're traveling and you want a tiny color chart to put in your box and you've only got room for one swatch of each color what you can do is graduate within the swatch so um, let's grab some color here let's go for the um, quinacridone magenta and what you would do in this case is in your little square you start dark one side and then you add water as you go across it won't be um, as neat and as easy to see the colors but it's a really good option as I said if you're traveling if you um, if you're going to an art class you just want a, uh, a tiny tiny swatch of each color just to put in your box you don't have room 
to carry a big fold up what you can do is just graduate your color so um, in order that I don't spread all of this dark right down to the end I'm starting the other end with water and going up to meet that and the idea then is to do sort of a mini graduated wash and to get the color darker one side than the other it doesn't have to be perfect just so that you can get an idea and you can make a little color chart with one each of your colors that looks like this for traveling so back to my jackman's color swatches you see that i've completed here now it's not perfect i have gone over the edges it's getting very dark here in the uk because it's winter we hardly get any light um, so i was trying to be quick also as i did the second one I left a gap by mistake. I meant to put the burnt sienna up here and I placed it down here. I've done whole day courses where students make lots of colour charts and um, you know everybody's all excited, everything's very neat and then all of a sudden someone says, oh damn, I've lent in my paint, I've lent in my paint and then someone else says, oh, I've mixed the wrong colour or I've painted the same colour twice. You really have to sort of get over perfectionism. I am a perfectionist as you can see by how neatly I try and lay things out. But something always goes wrong with colour charts. There's always a back run, there's always a smudge, there's always a colour painted in the wrong square. Don't worry about it because at the end of the day, it's just a learning tool. It's for you to take around with your paints and for you to consult and look at so that you understand your paints better. And if you've got that, if you've got an idea of the colours and how they look on your paper, then it's good enough. So don't obsess about uh, it being perfect unless you have all the time in the world. So let's have a look at these colours. Now I've written the pigment numbers down. Um, one thing I've noticed is that on the tubes the greens have the same pigment numbers which is odd and should not I imagine be the case. They are quite close to each other but one is the emerald green is bluish and the spring green has more yellow in. I wouldn't expect them to have the same pigment numbers unless it was the same pigment prepared different ways but I imagine that may be a uh, mistake on the label so I will ask the manufacturers about that. Um, I can also look now at these blues. I've got this cool blue here. I've got a much warmer blue here, which is uh, much more lilac based. And I don't know if you can see, but the ultramarine blue granulates a lot where the phthalo blue is transparent, which is what I would expect for these colors. I'm gonna bring them forward and hopefully you'll be able to see that in detail. And this is what color charts help you to do. They help you to see how your colors look and how transparent they are and how much they granulate. Look at this cadmium red. It's a very strong, sort of dull, almost I described it in the last video as a blood red. But once you water it all the way down, you get this beautiful, delicate rose pink. Who would have known? Some colors look so different in the pan. What, the one I think of most of all is quinacridone gold, which when you squeeze it out of a tube looks dark brown. When you paint it on a swatch like this, it's a beautiful, transparent golden yellow. So it's so important that you have your paint colors set out like this, so that you can see how they look. And if you never make any other color charts, at least go to the point of doing this. If you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm no good at color mixing, then color charts are even more important for you. I do teach a range of students. Um, some of them pick up color very quickly. I was born with a flipping color wheel in my head. I can look at one color. I can look at a green and tell you instantly which yellow and which blue would mix together to make that green. I don't know why my brain is set up that way. All I know is that um, it's probably taken the place of any ability to do maths. We all have good and bad points. But if you are someone who never feels that they can understand colour mixing, then making colour charts is going to be the most important thing that you can do because the colour charts will show you how to mix the colours. Going forward, I'm going to make some colour charts for you that show you how to mix one colour with another colour and how to um, lay out those colours so you can see what you get when you mix all of your colours with all of your other colours. And as I said, it's invaluable for you, whether you're good at colour mixing like I am or whether it's a, a difficulty for you, it's going to be equally valuable. I find myself consulting my colour charts for quite a long while and then as I get used to the colours and used to them, um, and they fix in my brain, I don't need to consult the colour charts as much. I could look at a yellow flower and know which of my ye yellows I need to use, but that comes after years of practice and that comes after years of looking at your colour charts. So when you're starting out, when you're a beginner, or if you're advanced and you need to know a lot more detail about your colours, then this is the thing to do. So do let me know in the comments if this has inspired you to make your own colour charts or perhaps adjust the ones you've got a little bit. 
Now, if you've just started painting, you're gonna find that you make a lot of mistakes and that's absolutely to be expected. It's nothing to worry about, but mistakes in watercolor painting can be just a little bit more tricky to fix than other mediums. I've got a really good video for you and I'm gonna show you how to fix 10 mistakes even after the paint is dry. So you can watch that video if you'd like to right now.